This afternoon, um, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes talking with you about data, and then Jody's going to talk to you a little bit about data, and then we're going to talk about our artifact and give you some time to work on your artifact, okay? So, Jody and I were kind of looking and thinking through um, the, because you remember we had eight hours of content, right? So we're, we were thinking through what's the most important pieces um, for you. And we decided that we want to spend a little bit of time in talking about using data to make instructional decisions. So I'm going to spend the first part of this afternoon talking about that. And the U.S. Department of Education and What Works Clearinghouse came up with five strategies um, for using data to make decisions. One is making part of uh, data a part of an ongoing cycle, so meaning it doesn't finish, but it's an ongoing cycle um, of instruction and of improvement for your kids. The second thing was to teach students to examine their own data. And that's really important that we help kids understand what the data says and then help them to set goals. And then these last three, we're not going to spend much time on that. That's establishing a clear vision for school-wide data use. And you probably already have something like that that exists. Um, and if you don't, you'll want to talk with your principal about having that to happen. Oops, let me go back. And then providing supports for a data-driven culture. Well, if you start on your campus with using data and talking about data, particularly in your PLC, if that's not what happens already, then that will, you can begin to be that catalyst. And then, um, I don't know that you have much say so about the district-wide data system. It's probably already established. But having those conversations with your principal, and then when your principal goes to those meetings, that's important. So the first one I want to talk about is making data a part of an ongoing cycle of instructional improvement. And as we do that, we need to collect and prepare a variety of data about our kids. And we do that through the formal and informal assessment. We also need to think about how are we going to interpret that data and decide how can we use it to improve learning. And as we're using that, we want to modify our instruction, modify or adjust. So in that way, accommodations and modifications that will fit our students. Because the bottom line is we want to increase their learning. Would you agree? Hello? Yes. Thank you. I heard a couple of yeses, yeah. I was trying to get them all. So when we do that, the first thing we do is to create a plan. We create a plan, we develop a plan for our students. Guess what, y'all? This afternoon, your artifact is a plan, and you're going to be creating a plan. So that's why we thought this was important. After you create the plan, then you teach, 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 teach. And after you teach, what do you think happens next? Yes, you reassess, you assess what happens. And after you assess, you have to analyze the data and create a new plan so you almost start over. That's why this is called the data informed instructional cycle. Now you know what happens? Typically we create the plan, we teach, we assess, but we don't spend much time analyzing. We don't do a deep analysis to really figure out where our class is or where individual students are. We just kind of place them in a group and say, this is going to be my small group, even though I haven't really fully analyzed that data. So like I said, the first thing is creating that plan. Then we're going to teach. Then we're going to assess. And what's that last one? Put a star by this one, because analyzing data is the important one. It's the one we do least often. So um, this next piece, there are some activities here. Um, and what I'd like you to do is look at the activities, at your table, choose one of those activities, and spend one minute talking about that activity. How can you make that uh, a part of what happens in your classroom in terms of that? Pick one of these activities. There are several there. And we're over on page. 
seven, six. Seven, thank you. With the activities to try, you have it right there on the top slide. Um, go ahead, you have one minute, I'm timing. back to the learning community in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. So, oh, I don't know how that happened. At your table, you had to choose one of these. Which one did you choose? And how would you use that as part of an ongoing cycle? Tell me. Yes. to share with parents or to share with the kids so they can see that growth as well. Okay. The second one is teaching kids to examine their own data and help them to set learning goals. We want our kids to understand what their data says and then we want them to be able to um, decide what are the next things I need to do? How am I doing? It tells them how, am I, how they're doing and providing feedback to them. Very often times, I see teachers who use a rubric, they circle the rubric, whatever the response is, and give it back to the kid. That's not enough feedback, because later, you find it in the garbage. Anybody found crumpled papers in the garbage? Maybe it was because they didn't understand the grade or didn't understand what was on that rubric um, and how it was going to help them and understand that it was really feedback for them in terms of how they're doing. So you want to explain how this is important, why it's important, and, so, uh, and help them set goals for the next learning opportunity. Now, here's an activity to try. If you can select one of these at your table again, and then I'm calling two tables to report out what did you talk about? Which activity did you choose and why? 
This is really about helping kids to see their own data. Now let me say why this is important. When you get ready to do your artifact, you are going to be analyzing your classroom data. And then you have to put your kids into small groups. When you put your kids into small groups, you have to have analyzed them individually, looking at where their strengths and weaknesses are, or their areas of growth, in order to put them into that small group. Y'all agree? Yes. So as I'm thinking about teaching my kids to own their data, what, which of these might we talk about at my table? Talk about one of those, and then how or why would you use it? Go, you have one minute. Come back to the learning community in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. What did you choose and how would you use it or why did you choose it? Come on, I need two tables. Okay, so um, not only you use the rubric for other kids or just the student himself? Other students are, are uh, judging or evaluating. Okay, good. They need to know where they're growing or where have they grown and uh, you know what things do they do well and where, what are the areas of growth. One more table. What did y'all choose and why? Good, pre and post assessments. So I know what my kids already know, and then where I need to spend most of my time. Good, thank you. So as you are preparing for your um, artifact, you're going to have to engage in analysis. And after you analyze, then you're going to have to adjust your instruction. And that's why it's called an instructional adjustment plan. So don't let those words throw you off. It's because you analyze and you adjust your instruction. Okay, as you look at your individual students, you have this slide probably in there, but one of the lines is bolded. I just wanted you to see what are the kinds of questions that you might ask in terms of data analysis. So Kinder, would you read the first one please? Okay, sorry. Kinder, could y'all read that one again, please? Okay, so you're looking at the results. Um, first grade, read the second one, please. Okay, and third grade, will you read the next one? You want to look at strengths, and then you want to look at growth. So strength and growth. And then fourth grade, read the next one, please. Fourth and fifth grade, read that one. No, I meant read the last one, I'm sorry. Are there? Okay. 
Okay, so you have your assessment, you have your screener, you've progress monitored. What other data can you use? Think about what you did from yesterday. What other data could you use? Shout it out. Observations, anecdotal records, running records. So there are other kinds of data that you can confirm, use to confirm, or to say, oh, this student really didn't know what I thought they knew, right? Um, so I wanted to go from there to our ELS, our English learners. Um, because as we're analyzing, we need to spend some time thinking about our English learners. How many of you have ELs in your classroom? Okay, almost everybody. How many of you know about LPAC? Should be everybody. The same amount of people that raise their hand that I have L's should have been the same amount that raise their hand about LPAC. By law, LPAC has to determine the procedures, and you have a guide there, one of those little books that has the LPAC procedures in there. And then they make the one that's important is they make a de assessment decisions on an individual basis for your students. And so when you have that ELPS, you have that ELPS Academy. Um, it's going to give you ideas and activities, instructional alignment that you can use for um, creating your artifact as you're thinking about your students. And you also need, as a classroom, think about what are the teach expectations and then what are the language expectations and consider what's the level of language that my student has. What are things that they're able to do? And which book is that one? the instructional tool. You want to use your ELPS instructional tool to help you with the, that second part, um, where they are with learning the English language. What are things that they are able to do and what kinds of activities, because you're going to have to put activities on your artifact, what kinds of activities could I use based on the language that these students have? Okay? Questions? All right. And I just um, talked about additional questions like what language, what kind of program are they in, how much background do they have, can they use their home language to help them in my classroom or how can I help them to use their home language in my classroom. Um, all of those, where's their level of comprehension might be different in comparison to my other students only because of language, not because they're not at that level of comprehension. So as we talk about adjusting instruction for our kids, we need to look at accommodations and we look, need to look at modifications. So accommodations are the support, right? That's the how. And modifications is the what? You got it. Good job. Am I going to change the content to fit my students? And if you are changing the content for your L's, your English learners, then you need some okay from the LPAC committee. Of course you're going to change accommodations, but in, ter in terms of changing and modifying the content, um, you need some other help before you get there for your students. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Yes. Thank you. I see lots of head nods. And then I put this slide in because we have to communicate the data with our parents. The new rule for House Bill 3, K2, is a 60-day reporting period. So from the time the kids take the assessment, you have 60 days to be able to report those results to the parents. And here's one that we may not be doing as often. We are supposed to notify parents about intervention strategies. Now, I know that happens in third through fifth grade because we have meetings with parents about the kids that were not successful on STAR and what kinds of interventions we're doing. But K2, I don't know that we're consistent about telling our parents the kinds of interventions that we are going to be using with um, students. So you will want to have a parent meeting and share some of the things that you do with kids. Help them understand what this assessment says. Help them understand where their students are strong what are those areas that are strong for this particular student or this, this, yeah, for their student? And what are some areas of growth and what are you going to be working on? And maybe they took the test 
And the data is something different than what you see with that student based on your anecdotal notes or whatever. Maybe it's different than what happened on this assessment. So you'll want to explain that. It looks like they're really low on this assessment, but I can tell you I've listened to them read and I know that they're able to do this and this and this and this. Does that make sense? So sharing that with parents. And then based on that, what are my next steps? And having the parents join in to help you with whatever those next steps are. Because how many of you have had parents say, how can I help my child at home? I see head nods. This is the place to tell them how they can help their child at home. So when you're getting preparing for that meeting, you want to have some idea of things that they can do to help that child at home. Okay? What questions do you have? Nothing. I kind of ran through that pretty quickly, but Jody? Yes, you're on. Um, why don't you talk at your table for a couple of minutes about, about how you use data on your campus in your classroom that you think is beneficial to your students. Or if you have a particular way that you're going to share with parents when you have your next parent meeting, your parent conference. What are some unique things that you do, like student-led conferences or something like that?
y'all hear me? Yes? I am going to ask that we do one thing, real, and it will be quick, but I want you to just do a, you don't have to share with us, but checking yourself and your group. If y'all would pop up real quick where you are and go stand in front of your poster that you did early yesterday morning about that. Has it broadened? Has it narrowed? Do you have just the same perspective today as you did yesterday? I want you just to talk about that for a moment. And we're not going to have you rewrite anything or add to or redact or any of that. But just think if there's anything about data that you have learned, assessment and data, that might in any way modify the definition that you came up with yesterday. Please have that conversation for a moment or two because you're about to work on your own in groups doing everything that you know about data to create this artifact. Okay? So have a conversation quickly. Okay, does any group want to say 
Any anything that you thought about possibly adding, deleting, modifying a different slant, different anything, or do you feel like where you started yesterday morning, your definition would stay just the same? Anything at all? No, I'd probably add something like. What might you add? There you go. So if not, yeah, data, something like data not acted on is kind of, right? I mean, I mean I, yes. An assessment, nothing done with it or data not acted on is, is kind of a waste of time to take the assessment, right? What do you think, Monica? that data is more broad than, yes. Data goes beyond, you know that. Okay, that's it. I just wanted to kind of wrap your head around, okay. Because we're gonna be using one specific, you can come back, one specific data set, which is iStation, for this artifact. But that doesn't mean that that data tells everything about the child, right? If you will please take out the handout that I gave y'all early yesterday morning. Page one says classroom data analysis. Looks like this and this may have been, remember? And actually the one I handed y'all has the little red lines or or yours color, I'm sorry. Yeah, the red and blue and black. This, for the artifact, this four pager, remember? Starts with seven questions on the front, then it goes to class, then it goes to small groups, and then where you, where you attach your record, your report, I mean. Okay, does everyone have that in front of them? Because we are determined that when you leave here today, you're not going to leave with all kinds of questions. You're going to feel solid on it. And then you're going to have an opportunity to go forth and work on it later. You're going to have an opportunity to continue to stay here. Depending on how quick you are, how much you've already analyzed your data, I'm going to be honest with you. There is a possibility that you're going to be able to kind of knock this puppy out today if that's what you want to do. Okay? So, here we go. For your second read grant, and I'm just going to say it, artifacts, you're going to, you know this, right? You're going to analyze what? Right here. Analyze. Let's say it together. Ready? I'm going to do the first part. For your second read grant artifact, you are going to... Okay, we haven't used the word month long, have we? We know that you're constantly, in fact, I've just talked to a couple of campuses, you're doing other assessments. We know that you, there, you have things outside of this artifact. You have things that you do outside of iStation. And so, when we talk about this today, I don't want to minimize everything else that you're doing, but obviously our role through this read grant for you to complete your certification is to submit this artifact. So of course that's all we're talking about, but I want you to know that we both understand it has a place in your life, in your instructional day, but for this read grant artifact, the way we're looking at it is, I know you have many other assessments, and I can say this right out. I would imagine that some of you um, well, any of you, but certainly intermediate teachers, it's going to get crunch time pretty soon where maybe you're more focused on some other assessments besides that station, right? And, and that's fine. And there, even in primary, there may be others. So I don't want you to think that we think this is everything you're doing, okay? It is an artifact as evidence that you know how to create, use, develop assessments, understand the purpose of assessments, how to analyze the data as a result of the assessment, and how to respond in a supportive way. Okay? 
So that's why this artifact is designed the way it is. So you're going to have a little bit of choice in it, but what we don't have choice in is we're going to use iStation data. That is what, when this grant began, that your district decided would be the thing that's across all the way from K through six, the one assessment that they know all students would be taking. At the beginning of the year, y'all submitted uh, the number of students that you're teaching. I know that's changed and flexed for some of you a little bit or a lot. But what um, MISD has provided us to provide to TEA is your beginning of year iStation report, your mid-year iStation report, and your end of year iStation report. So that's what, in this grant, if anyone is to look at it and audit, would look at student growth or progress throughout the year, okay? So that's why we're doing it, because that's part of the reprint. Um, so I understand you're using other assessments and other data as well. Um, but this is what we want for the artifact. You're going to use middle of year iStation data to complete this artifact that is wrapping your head around from when we do, uh, when the window closes and the assessment has been done, then I'm gonna have, and we, we did decide on this. We talked to a few teachers who were here yesterday, but actually I'm gonna get into the timeline in a minute. This is what it will include, and you can look at the sheet and follow along. Classroom data analysis of the iStation report, reports, whole class, Instructional adjustment plan based on the iStation data. Small group instruction plan based on the iStation data. That's it. You're going to analyze and create the details. And I'll talk to you about the details so you're real comfortable with that in a moment. Okay. So this is using the digital template from earlier today. Well, I gave you a hard copy of the template. You have it in front of you, that four pages. And as soon as I finish talking, I'm going to email you that same thing electronically. So if today in a little while you want to start filling in the fields, you can do it right here. Okay? Um, analyze your class data responding to each of the five questions listed below. And I think in my, on my slide yesterday, I said seven, because a couple of those boxes have two questions in them, okay? So there are five boxes, seven questions total. And this is them. See the first bullet? It's one bullet, but it has two questions. So you're gonna have a little box to electronically answer those two questions. I think that's pretty straightforward. And then, um, so part two, once you've analyzed it, you're going to create a class instructional adjustment plan. That's page two. And it's very simple to follow on there. Page two for your classroom instruction includes find two standards that your class has mastered. Yes. Um, are you yes. Yes. Okay, that one, um, I'm honestly, that, I'm sorry, because I said we will have every answer for you. I'm not sure how y'all would know how to answer that. So I'm, I'm telling you, if it's something that for some reason, um, you're, you're, you know, every district's a little bit different, and some are more forthcoming and sharing with information, some are a little bit more private about we do not share information. If your principal is able to tell you, like, just pick something. Say that your overall class was, um, let's go back, read that question to me again. Compare. Okay, so that is going to be something, and I'll even, I will ask for y'all. I will ask Joe Rivera, and I'll ask your principals. These are two questions that they're being asked. Is it okay? Can you provide them the information to like, I don't, I don't know exactly what it would look like, what format it would be in. If your district says, no, we are not doing that. We don't, you know, because of course they wouldn't give you names, but they could possibly give you a ranking. 
you know, or something like that, or the range was from here to here, and you already know your range. So we needed to go over that, and I'm glad you asked it, but you may have to put NA in there. I'm really not sure, okay? But I know you don't have that information right now. So I'll be responsible, and Clarissa will, for getting that answer to y'all as to whether you even need to include that information. Are we good on that one? I'm sorry, I should have asked. But I'm going to try today while we're working to, to contact Jill and see if I can get an answer on it so we'll know before you leave. If not, for now, leave that one blank. Are we good with that? Stop me, just like that, Cinnamon. Is that seriously clear with everybody? Yeah? Good? Okay. Um, so, the two standards or skills the class mastered. So you're going to look at your overall class plan and you're going to go, hmm, which skills did we do really well on? I'm just telling you this, go with the highest ones. Because you might say, now I'm not really considering that mastered. But you're going to select the ones that they did the best on. And then as a result, what are you going to do? The fact that they already have that done really well. I'm going to give you an exemplar in a moment and that will really help. Okay? And then you're going to have to answer. So as a result of this, let's say they did really well according to iStation here. And it's something that you haven't yet covered in your curriculum. What might you do? Okay? It's going to be individual. The second one is what are the two standards or skills the class did not show mastery on? So I would assume you would select the two lowest overall and then figure out what am I going to do as a result of that? How am I going to adjust my instructional plan? Because it looks like as a whole class, this is an area I need to spend some focused instructional time on. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we're going to do not exactly the same thing, but oh. And then, of course, it goes to, when we think about our diverse learners, how will you provide enrichment opportunities for advanced? Okay? So let's say that on that second bullet, that you've selected the two things that the class did really well on, but you have two or three students who are like acing at 100%. Or even the, the, the two that the class did not do well on, and you've got a couple of students who did extremely well aced it. Well, what are you gonna do when you need to go back and do whole class instruction? on the ones that were very low, and you've got three kids over here that absolutely have it mastered. Are they gonna sit through that whole class instruction? Or are you gonna have something else for them to do? Does that make sense? I keep asking you, but I wanna make sure we're clear. And then, on the other end, how will you provide, how will you provide modifications to ensure all students have access to grade level learning? So that's when we think about our diverse learners and then also consider, hmm, are there any who might need something differently? Okay? It sounds like a lot right now, but I can almost promise you once you see the sample, you're going to be better. Y'all have questions? We good? Yeah? Okay. Then, page three is the small group instruction plan. So clearly at that point, you're going to be finding special groups who maybe are the outliers and like, oh my goodness, I see these three kids. You know, the whole class did fairly well, but these three really need help with blank. These five really could use help, and these four. So you're gonna pick three different groups. No, oh, excuse me, yes, it does say three. I'm gonna tell you on the sample that I give you, it did not include the third one. It only has two small groups, but on this artifact, it has three that you'll fill in. Okay? This says, um, I want you to look here how it has a schedule of how you will provide it. Okay? When you see the sample, you're not going to be overwhelmed. It doesn't have specific times. It has something like two days per week, and that is the schedule. Okay, so under that, include the students, and we can't do names, okay? So you can do an initial 
You can do if you have like your class um, roster, and a lot of people have their uh, teachers have their students named one through twenty-three or whatever it is. So you can use student numbers. But of course, we're not going to put student names on this. Include the objective. The objective is just the TEAT, the standard. And then where it says list examples of reteach activities you will use, I think once you see the sample, you will feel much better. When it says activities, notice it doesn't say um, list um, or include lesson plans for each. That's not what we're expecting you to do. So, um, this is going to get more specific when I show you the sample. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to let you look at it. Lastly, describe how you will ensure groups stay flexible in order to meet the needs of all participating students. Okay, here are the details. Use our provided sample as one way that you can include the details in the plan, and I'm about to show you that sample in a moment. Um, for example, you're going to see that this one in those boxes that you fill in is kind of like a little narrative paragraph. So if you want to do that, you can. If you want to use more of a, a bulleted list, you can do that. I want you to understand that we know we want this to be useful for you. So it is a plan. Y'all know the answer to this. If you're creating a month-long plan, thinking, oh, these kids who are really struggling with blending, you know, I could do this, I could do this, or I could do that. You don't know what's going to work, right? You might try the first one, and you may be like, this isn't cutting it. You might try the second one, and you're like, this is great. I'm really seeing something. And based on that, you might not ever go to the third activity. Okay? And I had a conversation with Rebecca Harris yesterday saying, Tell me that we're good. And when I explain this to them, we're saying it is a plan. But we know that we have to be flexible with the plan. So the artifact is showing that you can think ahead when you know kids are having trouble with blending, segmenting. You can think of three different activities that you might try. I don't know. Is it tiles? Is it, I mean, what is it that you're going to try? And that's what you write. I'm not trying to make y'all think this is not. We hope that it's helpful and works. But no one is going to be coming in and having you send reports of how you're implementing this plan. Okay? When we come for your classroom observations, we'll probably want to have a quick conversation. How's it going with, you know, small groups or your whole class? We can talk about that and give you feedback. But we're not going to be coming in and monitoring your implementation of this plan. Okay? You will not, um, we will not score it using a rubric like we did the last artifact. There is no rubric. You will be given written feedback and notification that the artifact submission is complete. Okay? And with the three sections of your artifact, you know, which was page one, answer questions, page two, whole class, page three, small groups, page four, you put a report on it. Okay? So you'll cut like, because you need to submit it electronically, so you'll either take a photograph or electronically copy and paste that onto page four. Okay, so that's exactly, I know that's a question you have. Hmm, by the 27th or February 24th? In having conversations with some of you yesterday, we realized that your Midland, middle of year January date closed Monday, either last Friday or this Monday, okay? So you just took it um, for, yeah, for January. So that's considered the most middle of the year one. We also have heard, um, and so this is where I want y'all to hear me, and then if we need to kind of both open up the discussion and make some changes, Clarissa and I are here to listen to you because we want it to be workable for you. So in talking to some teachers yesterday, there were a couple who said, I'm ready to go. We just finished last week. I'm going to get that report, and that's the report. Yeah, that's good. I can use my iStation report and get going. A couple of teachers said, I'm going to be honest. I'm not really comfortable using my January um, iStation results. I've got to be honest, coming back, kind of, that's a 
wonky kind of time for of the year for kids. I don't know that it's the most reliable. I had some kids who were gone, you know, on there. I would really rather they're settled back in school. Could we use the February window? And once they complete their February I station, can we use that? So Clarissa and I are open to you choosing what you think is going to be most workable for you. We also know some of you, depending on your grade level and your campus, you have other assessments that are coming up, either this month or next month. So we want to respect where you are, what's going on, what you think is, you know, I mean, yes, you need to submit this for your certification, but we also want it to be workable for you. So we're good with you choosing. Do you want to use your January data? knock it out and be done, or do you want to wait for the February one and do it from there? Now, that kind of brings us to this window that we want to explain to you. The last thing we want to do is put you under undue pressure, but at the same time, um, I'm going to ask you a question that I want you all to answer. If we say use your January um, iStation report or data and submit this to us by the submit your plan to respond to the January data and submit it to us by March 1st. Exactly. Did you win? Why would we not say that? Y'all answer it for us. Yeah, I, I, it's useless, right? Really? Are you going to submit a plan March 1st and then start implementing that plan? To respond to January data when you've already taken a February one. So we know the window's kind of tight and we understand you have a lot else to do, but we feel like when we give you the sample, really do, we're saving it for the end, you're going to go, okay, I can do that. So we set the window for artifact submission. I station testing window is for a week and then two weeks later, on a Monday, that's the deadline for submitting. So it gives you, you know, you can do the testing when you decide to in your window and then you've got two more weeks. And if you want to submit it three days after, seven days after, one week, 10 days, but you've got two weeks to analyze it, answer these questions and submit your claim. Now be honest with us. We thought two weeks was reasonable and not so, because if you wait three weeks and submit it, you're already on another iStation window because I'll test monthly. So be really honest, forthcoming. Tell us what you think about the option between January, February, a two-week window. I know you haven't seen it yet, but from the closing of the iStation window. Yes. So y'all's ended on, it was the 13th through the 17th. Is that right? Oh no, 7th through the 13th. I'm saying it wrong. So the 27th would give you two weeks, January 27th, from when the iStation window just closed. Is that? Create your plan and submit it. Oh, you mean from today? Yeah, we're, we just, and really we said that because we were like, maybe we should wait till February. And then some people said, you know, and it may just be a few of you. That's why we want you to talk to us. Some said, uh, this, we've already taken it. You know, we're ready, to, we're ready to go. We need to get from, if the January data is fresh and that, we don't need to wait three weeks to submit our plan to you. That's too long, okay? So. It doesn't matter to us if you submit it January 27th based on this, the assessment you just took, or if you wait and use February and submit it by the 24th of February. That's what we're proposing, but to an extent, we can certainly be flexible. So we need to hear from y'all now, because we're the ones that are going to agree to it. And I don't know, uh, Clarissa, you may have something else you want to add to it. This is just what we're proposing to y'all. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else you're wondering before looking at the sample? And Clarissa, you want to add anything? No, it's pretty much um, what you said. Um, either the 27th or the 28th, but for me, um, the last day is the 28th or March 1st. So if you're doing your February data to turn it in to me, um, not later than March 1st. Okay, and okay. we'll do the same thing. I mean, this, this was yeah. what we talked about looking two weeks forward. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make my date different than yours if we need to change it to March 1st and we're agreeable to that. We just want it to be workable and we don't want you waiting three weeks and we don't want you feeling too pressured. So, okay. Here you go. And I apologize that we don't have hard copies, but we don't and this is all PDF. But I know you'll be able to tell from here. Um, yes, I will. I just need to find the right place first. No. I can't. I really, I can't. Because these are samples for us. But one of the things we don't want to do as well is give you this and say copy it. Okay? So you can kind of take some notes. I'll be honest, if you want to use your phone, um, we're not going to be weird about it. But this is not part of the presentation. This is part of the literacy coach piece where we said we need something. So I want to talk you through it real quickly. Please get your, your seven question page out. And we're going to look at this. And let's see. I'm trying my best, yes. Come on. I don't want that. I don't know why. Why this is staying over here, you guys? What? Am, pardon? What am I not doing? Because I'm not sure why that's staying there. Right here. It's smaller. Oh, how about this? That helps, and then scoot it over. Thank you all. <laughs> okay, so let's look at what they said. What students performed on grade level and who was significantly below or above? So look, scored developed those, whatever it is, seven, I'm not counting, those numbers, those students. It just listed their student number instead of their name, okay? And then scored still developing, boom, it listed their numbers. Y'all good with that? Could you quickly find that from looking at your report? Now, of course, this is based on TPRI. One of the things that they have as an activity for us to do is to lead you through the entire thing using the TPRI report and us creating one of these. And Clarissa and I thought, well, first of all, y'all don't use TPRI. It's very confusing then looking at that report. So we thought it would be better to walk you through this and then let you just do it with your eye station. Okay? Yes, because you can't put student names on it. Okay? And the terminology you're going to see on this example is from a TPRI report. So, of course, yours wouldn't say what this is. Okay? So, significantly below or above. Quick observation. Student 20, while developed, scored lower than the rest of developed student. One to watch in order to make sure scores don't drop. Students 2, 8, 13, 17, 22 all had no developed inventory traits. Students 3, 5, 6, 9 all had 6. That is what was included on this. Does that seem doable? I mean, when I looked at this, I'm like, okay. Then, the whole page. Okay. Now, 
It says to save paper, other student results are not included in this one. How does my classroom data compare to the others? We're not sure if y'all are going to get that or not, but let's look at what this um, teacher included. Other classrooms across the district and previous classes both scored similar, similarly in terms of the number who were at develop and still developing. However, there were differences between several of the subskill categories. This class had more students that needed remediation in letter to sound linking and book and print awareness than any other class and also had more students developed in listening <coughs> comprehension than any other class. Okay? So this teacher had her class report and other class reports and in comparing them, that's what she came up with, how hers compared to the others. Do you see how she just listed two things that, she, that stood out to her as differences? Yeah? I know y'all are quiet, but you gotta tell me if you're good, if this is making sense. Give me some head nods or stops. Yes. We don't know. I don't know if y'all are going to get that information or not, but I'm going to find out, okay? This section may be the section that we have to put in A. If your district is not going to provide you with overall, not teacher names, class names, student names, but provide you with this overall, it's okay. You won't be able to complete it, and we understand that, okay? We'll just put in A and move on. Look, um, this teacher said beginning of year action and middle of year action. So apparently through TPRI, they, this school, this teacher probably got her class report, grade level report, district, and you know, overall. So this is what she was able to come up with. What strengths does this data highlight? More than half of the class have developed rhyming and blending word part skills. One sentence. Okay. And then what class areas of growth does this data highlight? Only, yeah, only 30% of the class have developed letter to sound linking skills, 4% have developed deleting initial sound skills, and none of the class have final delete, uh, deleting final sounds skills. You tell me right there, remember how you've got to do an overall two areas that the class is struggling on? Didn't they just answer it? 4% and 0% of her class, or his class. So right there are the two whole class skills they'll probably work on. Deleting initial sound skills and deleting final sound skills. Looks like the two areas. Then what subcategory skills need to be addressed? Rhyming, because it's at 43% developing. Word blending is at 39% developing. Blending phoneme 61, letter name identification 52, and listening comprehension 57. So this teacher has said out of those big areas, these five seem to be the lowest. And just listed them and put the percent. So when you think about that first page and analyzing your report, do you think this, and I did even ask to make sure, because I know y'all like specific answers. I said, so they need to write narrative, and she said, they can do bulleted, they can do narrative, they just need to answer the questions. We're not looking for great detail, we're looking that they know what percentage is struggling with what. Is it, is it a big percentage? Is it a small struggle? Is it a big struggle? And in what skill area? That's really all they're asking you to do to identify for whole class. You're going to see that the next page is very similar, but the percentages will be different. And it goes into three, three different skills. So let's look at the top. For two standard skills the class mastered, how will you adjust your skill instruction plan to free up time? So rhyming and blending word parts, the class did really well on. Right? So let's read the narrative. I'm only going to do one of them. Let's read the narrative for skill rhyming. 
Because it is beginning of your kindergarten, I'm not comfortable taking rhyming out of the instructional plan, especially with only 57% of the class having fully developed rhyming skills. However, in order to free up instructional time, I plan on incorporating rhyming activities into read-alouds, class callbacks, and song time for the whole group, and I'll focus the majority of my direct instruction in small groups with identified students. These lessons will focus on identifying the onset and rhyme and generating common word, word family lists. So she wrote four sentences to explain what she's going to do with that skill that, the, that they did well in. Okay? Blending. Do you want me to read that one or do y'all want to look at it? It's just one more example. Then this is where um, the, the kids did not do well. And so both of them, well, we'll read the leading. I'm going to read the shorter one. Letter to sound linking. Now we'll go at the top. Before jumping into deleting initial sounds, I want to back up and begin by identifying phonemes with a word. Because so few students can delete it, it tells me that we may need to build isolation skills before we begin manipulating sounds. The first thing I will do is build in direct instruction, modeling activities daily during morning meeting. That's one thing. Uh, the can, this can pair with our second skill focus, letter to sound linking, by having students identify the initial sound and then link the sound to a letter. We will begin by identifying, I mean, I can keep reading. And the last sentence says, finally, regular formative assessment checks during small group will help me identify which students may need additional support. Just like, to me, this sounds like how she would be talking in her head. Here's what I'm gonna do, this is my plan. So that is her plan for a month, you know. We don't know if, it, if she'll really carry it out for two weeks or for five weeks. But that is her plan in thinking ahead between now and the next time that I assess. This is what I plan to do in response to the current data I have. All right. Now we're going to look lastly at small, no, advanced. Okay. Um, let's look at the advanced. During small group instruction, I will provide two main enrichment opportunities for my advanced student group. First. The students who have mastered blending phonemes will move directly into segmenting words into sounds during small group. So she's going to beef up their small group. And secondly, those who have mastered letter sound linking will begin building CBC words during small group instruction. So that's the two things that she's going to plan on doing. And then the accommodations, because it's beginning of kindergarten, all students currently have access to grade level learning. Tier one. Throughout the year, as students develop and literacy skills becomes more varied, I will ensure access to grade level learning for all students through ongoing formative assessments, flexible small group instruction, and scaffolding support. So basically how she's, her plan for differentiating. And then we get to small group instruction. And I want you to see how this looks. That first section that you can see all of it, that is for small group one, that's for small group two, and y'all's actually has three on it. Clarissa, we haven't talked about this, so I'm putting you on the spot. The sample here has two. The sheet that we gave them has three. We want to have a conversation right here with y'all being honest, because to me, it's not how many groups you can do, but that you're being thoughtful about your small groups. Does it only have two on yours and three here? It does have three on the template we gave you. Yes, two in the handouts and three there. What do you think? about the handout um, I, I'm thinking about the handout so I kind of want to say let's do this on the handout because that's Two. what they gave us yeah okay so y'all good with that choose two small groups so what you can do electronically is that third one at the bottom just delete it okay 
Because we know, depending on your class, depending on the day, you may be pulling one small group, you may be pulling four. We don't know. But this isn't the plan for everything we're doing. You're doing. We know that. So if you can find um, data that supports, you need to at least do small group instruction in these two areas for these two groups of kids. That's evidence that you know what you're doing. So are you all okay with that? That will lessen that one by one. So let's read one of them. So we've already heard that rhyming for some kiddos, okay? So it says the skill rhyming is the skill group one, and uh, the objective is students will be able to identify and produce rhyming words, okay? That's probably something we need to talk about because the objective does need to not just be rhyming again, right? Specifically in kindergarten, what does it say in the standards that the student needs to be able to do with rhyming? So let's do make sure we talk about, we talked about objective when you submitted your lesson plan and your objective does need to be aligned to your standards, okay? So we, do, we don't want to say students will rhyme words, okay? Is that good? And then right there it has a standard under it. So once you've identified that rhyming is a concern and go to your standards and see what the state says that we need to do with rhyming, select one, that's what you put down, okay? And then the participating students, it doesn't have anything there in this one, but that's where you would just put your numbers. And then, um, well the students, I'm sorry, that's right below it because for this particular skill group, she's doing two different students, two different groups. Do you see that? That's the way this teacher's doing it. Students 1, 2, 7, 17, 19, and 23 are in one group, and 8, 13, 14, and 22 are in another group. So it looks like with rhyming, six, six, 10. Looks like she had 10 students that she wanted to do further small group instruction, and then she broke them into two separate groups. That's what she chose to do. Here's my big question for y'all. Do you have to do it that way? Be real loud. Yeah. No. And that's one of the reasons why I think we've been told, don't give one exemplar. When you give one lesson plan, sometimes people think they have to follow that. It needs to include these components, but it doesn't need to look just like this. The reason the teacher probably did that is because what she wants to do is work with these 10 kids. These in a certain way, because look, she's doing different things. Group one, these kiddos to the left are identifying matching rhyming words. Skill practice will occur through, occur through sorts, matching, songs, and bingo. That is her plan. Is that a lesson plan? Huh? It's really, it says activities, right? She just put the activities down. Group twos is a little different. Identify onset and rhyme, generate common word family list. Both group skill practice will occur through sorts, matching, songs, and ego. Okay, so that's for that small group. We'll look at one more because we're almost finished, just so we have some variety. Do y'all want to look at, well, there are only two on here. This one's about blending again. She chose to have two different groups because that's what her dad has said. They're going to, a group one is going to identify counting individual words within compound and look at group two, counting syllables within multisyllabic words. So group two is going to have a little bit of a different focus. Does that look like a whole bunch of work to just do your plan? Part of this was bulleted, part of hers was narrative. And then the last, describe how you will ensure the group stay flexible. It says pretty much what it did before. I'm going to administer short, formative assessments every other Friday in order to regroup students based on their skills need. So I'm hoping, you don't have to do this, but I'm hoping in here to kind of hear a little bit of a sigh. Be honest with me, does this seem more doable than when we were looking at our October artifact with the video and the lesson plan, okay? Your, your data 
you know, you, you may say, oh my gosh, I've got so many in this one, this is a small group, or no, this is a whole group. Let your data drive what you do. And you're not putting down everything. It's only two groups based on the most recent iStation data, and then two skills that your whole class is struggling with. And as a result of that, what's your plan? Bullet it, narrative it, okay? So I'll leave this up here so that we can flip back and forth to any, any of it if we need to. But I hope you understand we're not trying to be secretive, but as um, you know, part of this grant, we're supposed to give everybody the same thing. And um, giving you something like this, we know that it makes you kind of feel like, oh, well, I have to do it that way. You do not. That's why there's an open field for you to, you know, like I could see some people would copy and paste the line that says blending that had the percentages and then copy and paste and put it in there going these are you know these are the class percentages that showed the lowest was blah 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 that's fine okay it just needs to be submitted electronically now what what have we not answered what questions might you have what you still need from us And what are you thinking about the January, February thing now that you've seen it? You want to, like you're, some of you are like, I'm ready to do it, correct? That was the consensus yesterday when we were talking to people who were just staying here after. And others were like, no way. Based on what's happened this last couple of weeks at my campus with assessments and kids and teachers changing, no, I'm not ready. You use what you have when you have it, right? Mm -hmm. Because this plan probably, hopefully, you know, a month of working it, you will have, kids will have progressed. And then after that, you're going to have to change your plan anyway, right? Okay, so thinking about this, I'm only curious. I'm not writing names down, nor is Clarissa. Nobody, it doesn't matter to us one bit. Who is thinking at this point that you're kind of ready to jump and use the January data you have. Just put your hands up high, because I'm just kind of, okay. Who is thinking, no way, or we've got other fish to fry, and we're gonna, we're gonna use our February? Not too many. Who doesn't know yet? And that's fine too. You're just, okay. So here's what we wanna do. We wanna make sure that nobody leaves here today with a question. So I'm gonna kinda do that awkward pause while I wait a while and let y'all just kind of talk at your tables and talk about what we did for about two to three minutes because I know that when people start talking, sometimes the questions come up. So talk at your tables right now about what you heard, what you're thinking, what this artifact entails, and see if y'all come up with any questions we haven't answered besides the comparing to district and classrooms, okay? Please talk.
Yes.
And sorry, this was the long, awkward pause to give you time to talk to make sure no for I mean, we'll, we'll be here and we'll be walking around, but if there's something that we feel like the whole group needs to address, I'm kind of a dog with a bone with making sure you don't leave here this time like we left last time. I don't want that for anybody in this room. I don't want it either. Okay, then please hear me out. Can I make sure I have your attention on this one? If you know for sure that you're going to be using February data, you can't get started today, correct? Are we good with that? But we want to make sure your questions are answered. So Clarissa and I are going to be here. We're going to stay here. I'm going to go back here and email the template to everyone. But if you know you're using February, would you agree that it's a waste of your time to sit here? Unless you want to kind of review some of it or talk with friends and see what they're doing and work collaboratively, we are going and we're going to try to find out the answer as soon as we can about comparing class, class and district data. But if you know you're doing February, once you receive this and your questions are answered, you can leave when you want to leave today. And then, um, our January workers, we are here to help you knock as much out for the whole thing if you want to. Okay? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah? Okay, y'all want to work. <laughs> Please 
to Jess, uh, Jessica your attention real quickly. I asked her to do this for me and then I forgot. If you'll just hang on, it's very brief, but listen to Jessica please and she's gonna give you something. Thank you. 